my name is Doug Cook, and I work for NOFA Mass as the Education Events Coordinator. And with me today is Marge, who is our Registration Coordinator. Some of you have met Marge as well. And I have most of you on, on mute, so if you have any questions, you can type them into your chat function, and we'll go ahead and um, answer them as they sort of as we get to them and we're definitely gonna have time for questions and answers at the end. So I wanna thank you all for joining us and especially our members who make all of our advocacy and education possible. We also wanna thank our sponsors, New England Biolabs for helping support the, this um, pollinator webinar. And with that, I think I will le let it go to Dan and Dan can introduce himself and we'll have some slides for you, for you all. Good, okay. All right, um, I think I'm good to go. It sounds like what we're gonna do today is a little more of a, uh, a little more interactive than just me sitting here kind of being the talking head. So I'm, I'm hoping to hear some good questions from folks, if not during, you know, definitely as we kind of move along. We've got two sessions that we're gonna be getting through and I got a lot of material to cover. Um, so let's just kind of get started. Um, this is our basic rundown of what I think we're going to kind of get into, um, general concepts. Um, species choices is going to end the day and we'll start again tomorrow. So as far as today, we're going to start with kind of this idea of bringing life to the landscape. Um, it's going to be a little bit broader than just the strict definition of pollinator, because I think most people when they hear pollinator means they want to bring life to the landscape. And, you know, they tend to not feel too bad if that means bringing in a songbird or two at the same time. We're gonna try and kind of decide exactly why, um, it's not that you could decide that one pollinator say matters more than another, but you start recognizing that these different insects and, and different life forms play different roles in the landscape. And understanding what roles they play can kind of help you to better understand how to bring them to your site and you know what they can do for you. We'll talk specifically about lots of plants. Um, uh, the majority of today is going to be different species that we're talking about and kind of bringing up different points as we go through these different species. Um, and we're gonna kind of compare what we call the best plants for wildlife and then bring humans into the equation. Cause I don't think it's really fair to say this is a, uh, you know, it's not that we're ever simply trying to build pollinator habitat without the thought that people are going to be a part of it. Um, whether that be a wild meadow or whether it be a farm or whether it be a home garden, you know, there's always people involved and we can't really forget that. And that's going to become quite clear as we start getting into things. So let's start with the pollinators themselves. Um, the question is, what do pollinators really need? Um, there's great enthusiasm around pollinators right now, um, which is really quite nice. Um, the thing is, with all that enthusiasm, there is some very good legitimate information out there, and there's some very good, well-meaning, very incorrect information kind of passing around right now. Um, I see these sorts of lists all the time. I love these things. Um, you know, you can catch them anywhere. And a lot of times, they don't really make a lot of sense, or at least they don't support the, the, the pollinators that they may claim to support. Um, if you were to take this list and yank the native species off of it and just plant things like lavender, catmint, sage, cilantro, you know, all plants I've got in my garden, um, we are now providing host sites for 14 different pollinator species. Um, 14 species, not bad. Carex is one of our native sedges. Um, this is a, a grass-like plant. It doesn't produce an insect pollinated flower at all, and yet it supports 36 different pollinating species. Um, this one native plant supports more life than the entire previous list devoid of the natives. Um, the marsh eyed brown is one of those insects that would not survive without carex. Um, and in the case of the brown and in, well, the case of really everything feeding on the carex, it's rarely this adult stage that becomes the important one. Um, it's not the moth, but the caterpillar. So let's stick the natives back on the list and all of a sudden we've gone from 14 different species supported to 216. Um, that's kind of why native plants really matter. Um, it's a matter of kind of these, these very large numbers of different diversity of different life forms that are brought to the equation when we start including native plants in our planting list. Um, the nice thing about this is you don't need to get hung up on planting nothing but natives. You can still have your crocus and your calendula and your poppy and your sage. There's nothing wrong with it. You just want to make sure to include your assuming native sunflowers, asters, and enemies in the mix or whatever else works on your site. Um, the other thing you don't really have to worry about getting hung up on is exactly what we mean by native. 
Um, there's, there's some great arguments to be had, and I will have them for the next six or eight hours if you want to. Um, but pretty much when I say native, I mean we're talking about plants that are bringing life to the landscape, that are building habitat. Um, and where they fall exactly on you know, a state line or a county line doesn't really matter to me all that much as long as I'm talking about a plant that is active in the ecological system. So let's kind of put the same question into a little bit of a di different perspective. Does the monarch butterfly, and here specifically I mean just the butterfly itself, need milkweed? Um, and you can see in this picture you've got a monarch that is not feeding on milkweed. That looks like a New England aster. Um, the monarch butterfly is actually quite a generalist. It'll feed on just about anything. It's the caterpillar where that, that specialization comes in. And that's why the native plants tend to be so important. It's these specialized um, connections that make native species much more valuable to wildlife than non-native species that may or may not feed some generalist insects. Um, you've got something like the uh, Bombus impatiens, which is probably the most common bumblebee around here. It's one of our native species. It'll feed on just about anything. Um, it's, a, it's a generalist. Um, the vast majority of our pollinators, however, are specialized to one extent or another, sometimes to a single species, other times to a genus or to a family or to something in between. Um, and that's where the native species really matter. Take that another step further, the Cecropia moth. Um, this moth does not feed at all. It doesn't have mouth parts. Um, it's literally born for a short period of time, one to two weeks at the very most. It flies around looking for a mate, it finds a mate, it lays eggs, and the caterpillar stage is kind of your classic very hungry caterpillar. Um, so trying to kind of figure out where you kind of fall on this um, interest of, you know, the, the native plants and how they kind of interact with the rest of the ecosystem, um, this specialization is what matters. If you want cecropia moths, um, you need native trees. It's maples, birches, cherries, willows, I think basswoods on the list as well. Monarch clearly needs milkweed. Um, but in the case of both of these life forms and many others, it's this caterpillar stage we need to think about. Um, and when you start realizing that, you realize that it's not necessarily just about the flower. Um, it's many times about the leaves. And that's why something like Carex is so important. It doesn't produce an insect pollinated flower, but yet it's still a very important plant. So let's try and talk about actually which pollinators kind of matter on the landscape. Or maybe a better way to put that is, is how the different pollinators interact in different ways on the landscape. Oftentimes you hear save the pollinators and what people really mean is save the honeybee. Um, you see lots and lots of kind of save the pollinators images like this one on the right with a picture of a European honeybee. Um, we're not talking about a native species here, but a domesticated, you know, life form that we brought to the area. Sometimes you find something a little more specific, save the monarch. Um, you get, you know, the Pollinator Conservation Association, which is a pretty good group and clearly, you know, their, their poster child here is a monarch. You don't see save the flies as often, um, and yet you really should. Um, they are exceptionally important on the landscape. Um, and there are many other things that are very important that are not honeybees, that are not monarch butterflies. Um, we need to start looking at things on a much broader scale. Instead of necessarily just focusing on a single one, focus on a healthy ecosystem. Um, and then we start really feeding everything. Not to say it's not a good idea to help save the monarch and figure out you know, what's going on with colony collapse and so forth, but we can't put that in place of other things. We need to do that in addition to. Um, so what I'm saying here with native bees for plant health, um, bees are specifically the best actual pollinators from the, um, the plant point of view. Um, what bees are able to do that, that very few other insects do, um, and that includes your, your moths, your butterflies, your beetles, is they, um, they perform a function that's called a flower consistency. What that means is that this green metallic sweat bee that you're looking at here, this is, um, it's feeding on Dahlia purpurea. It's a, um, a purple pr prairie clover. And there's a very good chance that when this bee finishes feeding on this plant, he's going to look for another Dahlia purpurea. Um, they tend to kind of find a group of plants that they're feeding on, and then they feed exclusively on that group until they switch to another one. Um, why this is important is it means that if this bee moves from this plant to another dahlia, there's a very good chance it's moving pollen from this plant to another dahlia. Um, if this bee were to say go visit a willow flower, um, bringing dahlia willow onto a willow flower is not going to cause good pollination. Um, so they're really good at being effective pollinators. Um, butterflies, on the other hand, are a little less, you know, effective when it comes to this direct kind of floral consistency that bees um, show us. That's why bees are the ones that we tend to think of for, you know, farm use and for our agricultural products. Honeybees are not a part of the kind of ecological equation. Um, they're not a native species. I think of honeybees the same way I think of my chickens. Um, they're a domesticated animal. They're something that we bring in, that we take care of, um, and then they give us something in return. We get honey out of them. 
Um, but when we start talking about, say, pollinator ecology or native plant ecology or just ecology in general, um, the honeybees are not really the same sort of thing as the green metallic sweat bee, as the bumblebee, as the mining bees. Um, those ones actually help to keep ecosystems alive. Honeybees are something that can give us a wonderful product. Caterpillars play a bit of a different role, and I'll just lump the caterpillars in with the butterflies and the moths and, you know, kind of um, everything is just connected there. And what caterpillars do that bees don't do, that ants don't do, that, you know, wasps don't do, is they represent a very um, strong source of protein on the landscape. Not only are caterpillars important because they turn into butterflies, but they're important as food. Um, they are a very good meal for a passing chickadee or, you know, various other songbirds. And what this means is that caterpillars are very good at taking the energy that is stored in native plants in their leaves and, you know, in the forms of minerals and nutrients and so forth, um, digesting that, accumulating it in their body, and then passing that energy on to the bird that just ate them. Um, this means that caterpillars are very good at driving kind of an entire ecosystem function in terms of supporting healthy bird populations. And that then moves its way up those trophic scales and you start getting kind of a healthy habitat overall. Um, and the reason is because of their value on food. There's nothing to be said that it's not that they're, you know, great animals to have in the terms of seeing the, the adult stage butterfly and their value as a pollinator. Um, but to some extent, their value as food is, is almost their most important role. Um, and this isn't to say that you need to forget the rest. And what we've got here is a digger wasp. Um, this is one of the uh, parasitic wasps that you'll find around the area. They look mean. They're really not. I have to keep poking this one with my finger to get them in the frame so I can get the picture. Um, they're going to feed on, on nectar. They're going to feed also on, you know, well, nectar pollen. And they're also going to be looking for other insects to attack. Um, this is the guy that takes care of the tomato hornworms in your garden. Definitely a useful one to have. Um, and don't forget things like beetles um, and ants, which aren't really much for pollinating around here, but play a very large role moving seeds around, which is clearly an important part of it, and our songbird populations and so on. So um, I get this question all the time. What is the best plant? What should I plant? Um, this, is, this, is a, this is a loaded question, I think is the best way to put it. Um, it really depends on what we mean by the best plant. Um, if we start putting things, um, putting numbers to things can really help us out. Um, Doug Tallamy has done a lot of work um, kind of ranking the value of native plants based on lepidopteran diversity. And so these numbers come from his work. Um, oak is top of the list. I think a lot of people probably know this at this point. If, if you don't know what I'm talking about, read Bring, Bringing Nature Home. Um, fantastic book. So oaks top of the list for our area. Cherries are very close there. Willows as well. Um, start getting into the herbaceous spectrum. Um, the best herbaceous genus you can plant are the goldenrods. Um, the asters, back when they were called asters and not, you know, symphiotrichum and eurybian broken apart, they were number two. Um, now if, if the asters are all broken up, it's actually the wild strawberries that are number two. Um, then you start looking at something like lupin. Um, you know, compared to oak, 473 species supported, lupin only supports 26. Um, you know, and you might at first think, oh, well, clearly the oak is much more important than the lupin. And there is actually a fair argument for that. Um, but it misses a piece of things as well. Um, these numbers are really just showing you the number of species supported by each, you know, plant. They don't talk about which ones are specialized, which ones are generalist, and, you know, what if 472 of those oak species could also feed on cherries? Um, they can't. That's not how it works. But there is going to be some overlap. Um, and what you miss is sometimes the rare ones. Um, things like the Eastern Tail Blue and the Frosted Elfin, both of which will feed on lupin. Um, the Carner Blue, which feeds exclusively on the native lupin. Um, so even though our diversity number might be lower, you know, 26, we've got some really important kind of specialized insects in here. Um, so keep in mind that, you know, number of species supported is a really good way of starting to rank things, but it's not the only piece of the puzzle. And then you need to bring humans into the equation, because as I said, we're a part of this. And whether we're talking about gardens or farms or roadsides, you know, humans are a part of it. So if you take that list of, you know, species supported and, and break out the top 50, there's some really interesting ones into there. Um, ragweed is in the top 50 native genera. We've got dock, which I just pulled a lot out of my garden today. Um, plantain is in there, black locust, which is arguably invasive, although I'll argue against that and call it a native plant. But you, you know, you still may not want to be planting it depending on where you're living. Um, and then there's the question of if I am living in an oak forest, does it make sense for me to be planting an oak tree, even if it's the top of the list in terms of lepidopteran diversity? This is where humans need to come into the equation and say, you know what, I do want to plant an oak tree. I also want to plant a willow tree. I probably don't need to be planting ragweed. 
So let's talk about plants. Um, just because I don't like going in just straight alphabetical order, I'm throwing things into groups. Um, so we're gonna start with a group that I think fits gardens really well. Um, these are the kind of the beautiful plants. These are the stars of the show, the ones that tend to kind of work people over because they got a big showy flower. Um, many of these are gonna overlap into being, you know, tolerant of difficult conditions, edible, various other kind of values. Um, but these are nice looking plants. Um, we're going to talk about plants that I've got to called our solution plants, um, things that will grow for you pretty much no matter what your conditions are. Um, I've got plants that will grow in the sunny dry sites, in the shady dry sites, in the acidic soils, in the wet soils. Um, we've got plants that will solve problems on the landscape. Um, this is a section that I'm going to throw some curveballs at you. Um, when I first started looking into kind of choosing plants for pollinators, I had a lot of preconceived notions as to what I expected to show up on the list. You know, I thought it was going to be things like bee balm um, and echinacea and, you know, black-eyed Susan. And though many of those are on the list, um, there are things I didn't think would be on the list, like our grasses, like ferns, um, like plants that I've never seen an insect on, and yet they are extremely important for insects. We're going to talk about killing your lawn because, frankly, it's one of the best things you can do for improving pollinator habitat at home. Um, and then I expect that'll be where we end today. But if we keep going, we're going to get into edible plants that are edible not only for us, but for the wildlife as well. We're going to talk about trees. Um, and then we're going to kind of get into some design and species combinations. Um, I doubt we'll get to this kind of day two stuff today. All right, let's start with the beautiful ones. Um, just checking my time, seeing how I'm doing. All right, um, so we have a couple different native spireas um, in our area. Um, these are native to pretty much the majority of the northeast and parts south and west of us. Um, on the left, Spirea tomentosa is steeple bush. That's your pink one. On the right, Spirea alba meadowsweet, um, the white species. Um, both of these are extremely valuable, not only for the lepidopteran diversity that helps us to really start putting numbers to things, but these are ones that show up for some of our rarer, um, more specialized bees. Um, they're not going to the leaves the way the lepidopter are, they're going to the flowers. Um, and these are extremely valuable for both kind of life forms. Um, what's kind of nice about um, these is that they are tolerant of growing really anywhere that's sunny, um, from literally standing wet conditions into dry upland sites. Um, and so it means that these are pretty easy to work with. They'll grow just about anywhere you put them. Um, steeple bush, I'd say, probably wouldn't do as well in the dry sites as meadowsweet, um, but it will do fine in kind of traditional garden soils and perfectly fine in any area that you wouldn't call dry. Um, they're fantastic plants. These are also host plants for one that I think a lot of people know well. This is the banded woolly bear. Um, these are ones that we tend to see in late fall. They overwinter as an actual caterpillar, and you'll usually find them in the kind of leaf litter come springtime. The native sunflowers are, as a group, a very important group. Um, I think when you start breaking out herbaceous plants, they come out in the top five in terms of kind of species supported. Um, we've got a bunch of different species in New England. Some of them are easier to find than others. Um, some of them are easier to work with than others. Um, a lot of them are on the quite vigorous side, and I usually recommend doing what you see in this picture here. This is along a lake in New York, um, and this is pretty much just a berm of woodland sunflower, Helianthus tevericatus. Um, don't let the name fool you. It doesn't grow in the woods. It actually grows on woodland edges. Um, still likes quite a bit of sun. A little bit of shade's not a problem, um, but especially if it's getting good sun and especially if it's on the moist side, this is a pushy plant. Um, it's going to want to take up some space, um, and it's great at that. If you want something that'll kind of cover a berm or, or give you like a nice edge that you can work on, this is something I also work into meadow conditions somewhat regularly. Um, with that high competition that you find in a meadow, a species that can kind of push a little is really advantageous. Helianthus decapetalus, I don't know why they call it thin leaf sunflower. The leaves are not thin at all, but that's the name they gave it. Um, sometimes it's called 10 petal sunflower. It doesn't have 10 petals, so I don't know who's coming up with these names. Um, but Helianthus decapetalus is kind of like the better behaved brother to Helianthus divericatus. Um, so if you're looking at something for a garden space and you're not thinking about a spreader for a meadow or for, say, a pollinator edge on a roadside, um, decapetalus might be a better option for you. Both of these are exceptionally valuable, both for our caterpillars and our butterflies and our moths, but also for our bees as well. Helianthus tuberosus is one that edible folks may know well. This is the one that's called sunchoke, sometimes drusum artichoke. 
Um, the, the flower and the plant really looks quite a bit like the others, but then you get these um, wonderful tubers in the late season um, that I harvest in fall, and they're absolutely fantastic. Um, of the three, though, this one is the strongest spreading and growing species. It's a fantastic edible plant. I'll talk about it a little bit more when we get to the edible section. Um, but know that you want to put it in an area where you either want something to spread or you're going to you, you want something to spread. Don't put it anywhere you don't want something to spread. Um, I used to grow this one in containers for quite a bit um, because it allowed me to kind of keep it contained, literally. Um, and I was able to grow it in an area where I didn't necessarily want it spreading. But if you put it in the ground, expect a big patch. These are all host plants for the giant leopard moth. Um, one that we don't see around all that often, but this picture was taken at Garden in the Woods a couple of years ago when I was still there. Uh, the eutrochiums, these are the ones we were calling the eupatoriums, uh, the Joe Pye weeds. Um, you can kind of just ignore the species. Um, most of these, in fact, the, the three closely related ones, eutrochium fistulosum, purpurea, and maculatum, all play very similar roles ecologically and all actually look reasonably similar as well. Um, so if, if one species is supporting on one, there's a very good chance it's supporting on the others as well. And they are kind of interchangeable in the horticultural industry. So you can find these just about anywhere. Um, the, what I really like about fistulosum in general is the kind of architecture you get on this foliage and that dark stem that kind of really subtends these flowers nicely. Um, the other species are, are not quite that showy in, in their foliar effect. Um, that being said, I don't think too many people are really planting Joe Pye weeds for foliage anyway. Um, the flowers are really valuable nectar sources for a lot of butterflies. If you want um, a good plant for seeing butterflies, not necessarily just seeing the caterpillars, but the adult stages, Joe Pye weed is definitely one to include in your garden. Um, it's also one where when the flowers pass and the seed forms, you'll find a lot of small birds that like to feed on that seed. Um, we'll talk later about how, you know, not to clean up your garden too much. Um, and don't forget the point, the fact that a lot of these native plants, after they're flowering, produce seed that is really good bird seed. It's just kind of an added bonus. Um, this is it here in front of some, behind that, the, the kind of blue purple stuff in the back there, that's uh, Verbena hastata, the blue vervain. And the really tall guy on the right is Silphium perfoliatum, um, rosin weed or cup plant. Um, all right, to throw a vine into the mix, or technically a liana, which is just another word for a woody vine, um, Lonicera sempervirens, a trumpet honeysuckle. This is one I find myself recommending somewhat regularly because um, I've yet to meet anyone who doesn't actually like hummingbirds, and this is a really good way to see hummingbirds on the landscape. Um, they need more than just a good source of nectar, but a good source of nectar is probably one of the most important things for them. Um, you can probably see from these flowers, if you think of any traditional kind of plastic hummingbird feeder, the flower looks almost identical to one of these. Um, this is what hummingbirds are looking for. Good, long, red, mostly, tubular flower um, that they can get their beak into and suck large amounts of nectar out of. Um, this is an absolutely beautiful vine that um, probably blooms longer than any other native plant or really just any other plant that I can think of. Um, they, depending on the season, will usually start blooming in June, sometimes July if it's on the cool side, and then they'll go through September and often into October and sometimes a little longer than that. Um, this is the, the vine um, on the Hort Building at Garden in the Woods from a couple of years ago. You can see the size that these things can get. Um, they're not as fast growing as some other vines, but they definitely have some speed to them. Um, and these are, these are vines that want to twine around something. Um, which means they're great on picket fences, they're good for chain link fences, but they're not going to attach to a wall unless you give them something to, to wrap around. After the flowers start to uh, kind of pass, you get these fruits forming. The fruits will, um, you know, kind of will go from green to yellow to orange to red. Um, sometimes you catch them where it's kind of multicolored stage and then they're just going to ripen up entirely red. Um, these in the earlier season when they're in bloom, you see the hummingbirds really visiting them. After the flowers pass, the hummingbirds become less of a visitor and you start seeing other songbirds coming in and feeding on these berries. Um, they're definitely an active plant. Also one of the many host plants for the Cecropia moth. Um, Cecropia moth is kind of probably right in the middle in terms of generalist versus specialist. Um, they won't feed on anything, but they've got a pretty good list of things they will feed on. Um, they look like something out of a Dr. Seuss book. These are one of the funkiest, coolest caterpillars that you'll find around here. Um, a good one for introducing kids to if you want to see something playful. So most people know St. John's wort um, through Hypericum perforatum, which is a non-native herbaceous um, weedy plant that you find on roadsides around here. Um, we have a pretty good selection of native St. John's worts. 
Um, there's some really nice ones out there. For the most part, they're tough to find. They grow in very specific habitats. Um, but there are a couple standouts that I think people ought to get to know and work with more regularly. And this is top of my list. Um, Hypericum prolificum, this is the shrubby St. John's wort. This is a woody species. Um, usually gets, depending on the growing condition, somewhere between three and I'd say four, maybe four and a half feet tall. Um, usually about the same in width if it's got the light to do it. Um, this one loves full sun. It'll do a little bit of shade and is very tolerant of sandy, kind of well-drained, you know, crappy soils. Um, it's one that we actually used to grow in our parking lot islands back at Garden in the Woods. Um, it's also one that I'm including in meadows these days. It works well in a meadow where it gets mowed every, you know, two to three years. Um, I'd love to burn it if I could, but unfortunately I can't get the permits. But a two to three year mow, and this is a species you can just hit with a, you know, a brush mower. Hypericum asyrum, this one is harder to get your hands on, but if you're able to find it, it's a wonderful species. This is a herbaceous one. Um, that being said, it'll get as tall, if not taller, than the previous woody species. Um, this thing will get five or six feet tall if it's allowed to. It's called the Greater St. John's Wort. It's a much larger flower than really any of the other St. John's Worts, um, whereas the previous one is masses of these kind of nickel to sometimes even dime-sized flowers. Um, the St. John's warts are reasonably valuable from a, um, a caterpillar point of view. Their real claim to fame is the bee diversity that you'll find on these. Um, these are fantastic plants for just about every bee in the area, both generalist and specialist. Um, there's a lot of really specialized bees that'll feed exclusively on the St. John's warts, and I really would love to see more of them on our landscape. You'll also sometimes, if you spot it, find the camouflaged um, emerald on this one, as well as a couple others. Here it is uh, feeding on, I can't tell if that's Liatris or one of the asters, um, but it'll feed on either one of those. And it's got this unique method of literally camouflaging itself. Um, it'll pick petals off and kind of cover its body and, and help it to hide from the would-be predators, pretty much the birds. Cirrus canadensis, um, good choice if you're looking for a small scale tree. Um, these guys usually grow, uh, you know, they're pretty fast growing when they're young. They're going to get up to 10 feet, I'd say, pretty quickly. They'll then get up to 15 to maybe 18 feet on a more medium growth rate. Um, after they get to 18 feet, they really have slowed down heavily, but they can eventually get into the 25-foot range. Um, beautiful flowers in spring, just as the leaves are starting to emerge. you got, you know, kind of flowers in full bloom, so it makes it very, very showy. Um, they've got this ability to bloom pretty much right out of their trunks and their stems. So it's got a, a, you know, instead of kind of flowers only dangling at the end, they're, they're really covered in these things. Even once you get a big mature one, you'll get these little tufts of flowers popping right out of the trunk. It's pretty cool looking. You'll find a white form of it somewhat commonly um, in the horticultural trade. It's usually listed as Circus canadensis variety alba. Um, it's not really a true variety, but you can find it. And if you're looking for a white form, it's, it's kind of nice to have, at least to mix in with the pinks. They have these heart-shaped leaves that I find attractive even when the plant is done blooming because it's, it's an early spring bloomer. So it's, you know, it's blooming now pretty much. It'll bloom for another couple of weeks, um, you know, maybe a month if it's on the cool side during the season, and then it's done blooming for the year. You get fruits later on in the season, but they're, you know, nothing special. Um, but these leaves are really quite nice, something that I enjoy throughout the season. This is it um, interplanted with Halesia. Um, it's the Carolina silver bell, a really nice combination. The two just kind of work well together. Um, and you'll find both um, on, on Circus, again, this is one for some of the more rare bees. I think I've got a picture up. Yeah, this is a southeastern blueberry bee. Um, this is considered the most efficient pollinator of blueberries on the planet. Um, they are one that is being, um, they were working on trying to kind of, you know, pretty much make them available and, and moving them around. Um, a lot of people have decided that wasn't a great idea. Um, there's another species, the blue orchard bee, which is kind of in production more. Um, they're also fantastic blueberry bee pollinators. The nice thing about these native bees is if you have a blueberry orchard, um, all you really need to do is build good habitat. Plant a couple surces, make sure not to clean up your garden incorrectly in fall, and you'll find these bees starting to arrive, and then they're there permanently. As long as the habitat is healthy, they will stay there, and you don't need to bring in hives. They're just there on the landscape, um, which is really quite nice. So bee bomb is one that I always like to bring up because it kind of points out the importance of understanding which species go in which places and what each species can offer us. Um, bee bomb, sometimes just called, um, you know, sometimes referred to as scarlet bee bomb. But when I hear bee bomb, this is the species that I tend to think we're referring to. This is Monarda didyma. Um, this is the most common one in the horticultural trade. It's not very common on the landscape naturally, um, but you find it planted all over the place. It does very well around here. Um, and despite the fact that you don't actually find it anywhere in New England, it's technically a New York species. Um, it's still a fantastically valuable plant on the landscape here in New England for New England pollinators. 
Uh, Monarda fistulosa is a bit more common in New England naturally occurring. This is also a fantastic species. Um, this one will do drier sites a bit better than Monarda didyma. Um, didyma really likes moist soils and if it doesn't get it, you tend to get a lot of powdery mildew. Um, fistulosa is a bit more site adaptable, which is quite nice to have. Um, fistulosa is also the preferred feeding species for the hummingbird clear wing moths. Um, those kind of not hummingbird looking moth things that you see flying around in the late season, they love Monarda fistulosa. Monarda punctata um, really doesn't feed moths or butterflies well at all. Um, those yellow flowers are really much more attractive to bees and you find bees and wasps and, and various other kind of predatory pollinators coming in and feeding on this one. Um, and these are kind of going in order of drought tolerance. Monarda punctata will not do well in the moist soils where Didyma wants to be. Um, that being said, Monarda punctata can grow in these very dry, very well-drained sandy sites where oftentimes you have trouble growing a standard bee moth. Um, these are all important plants for variety of floral feeders, foliage feeders, um, and don't forget again that that seed that comes later in the season after the flowers have passed is still a really important thing. Um, I'll never understand why we go and cut back all our gardens in fall and then go to the store to buy bird seed. Um, that is bird seed right there. This is the, uh, the black digger wasp that you find on Monarda punctata. This is one of those predatory insects that'll help to keep pests out of our garden. Um, this is a flower longhorn beetle. Um, there's the great golden digger wasp that is a goldenrod crab spider eating one of our bumblebees. Um, the, the point is that this Monarda punctata is a really good plant for bringing in a great diversity of pollinators on the landscape. And though these wasps look mean, they really are not. At least it's not to us. They're, um, they're much harder on the tomato hornworms. Um, they don't really bother us at all. These are not predatory towards humans. They're not colony forming, so they're not aggressive. Okay, let's talk about some plants that I think of as kind of, you know, um, Really sure fire plants is probably the best way to put it. These are plants that will thrive in just about any landscape. Um, ones that will solve a lot of the problems that we may have to deal with on the landscape. Um, aronias are really good choices. These are the choke berries. Sometimes they're called aronia berries now. Um, this is becoming kind of the next superfood. There's uh, seven times more antioxidants in the, um, the black choke berry than there is in low bush blueberry, which is the kind of the great antioxidant plant. Um, and the nice thing about these is they'll grow in standing water. They will also grow just fine in, you know, dry sites, at least once established. Um, you get a flower in the spring, you get this berry in the summertime that is edible. It doesn't taste particularly great, um, kind of on the bitter side. The black one definitely have a distinct sweetness as well, and I enjoy that one a bit more. Um, but most people tend to juice these um, or throw them into smoothies. And this is actually something that ocean spray is growing huge amounts of and mixing into their juice mixes. Um, as I said, it's, it's becoming like a superfood, and so people, so people never call it chokeberry, they call it aronia berry, because that sounds a lot better than chokeberry when it talks about eating. Um, you also get this great fall color. Um, fall in, in kind of, you know, New England can be really fantastic. We have a lot of good options for fall blooming or fall foliage shrubs. Um, there's no need to be planting invasive burning bushes around when we've got things like chokeberries and service berries and blueberries and iteas, and we have lots of options. As I mentioned earlier, when it comes to herbaceous plants, nothing, literally nothing, is more valuable on the landscape than the goldenrods. Um, they get a bad rap, which is really not fair. Um, they are thought of as weeds, um, which is fair for a few select species, um, but not all of them by any means. I don't necessarily recommend planting something like Solidago rugosa in a small space. It is a vigorous spreading plant. But downy goldenrod, on the other hand, is a well-behaved plant that really can work its way into meadows, into gardens, onto roadsides, into green roofs, um, into wildflower strips on the farm. This is a plant that can easily be kept in place and still provide all this kind of pollinator habitat that we need. Um, it's a really nice species with these wand-shaped flowers, grows anywhere from full sun dry sites into partial shade as well. Um, pretty well adapted. Silverrod, the, um, this is the, the, the white goldenrod. Um, the flowers are often almost identical to the downy goldenrod, except in white. Um, I've actually got a meadow where I've got both of these planted and you get these just spikes of white and yellow flowers bloom together. Um, really quite breathtaking. Wreath goldenrod, sometimes just referred to as woodland goldenrod. Um, this is the goldenrod that'll really do well in your shady sites. You can take this right into your woodland gardens. Um, it's a fantastic plant for bringing that sort of pollinator habitat into the shade, which is sometimes a little harder to accomplish than in, say, an open meadow. And then Solidago speciosa, which I think of as kind of like the bigger brother to Solidago puberula. Um, so downy goldenrod being reasonably well-behaved. Speciosa is definitely more of a pusher. 
Um, not nearly as vigorous as some of the really weedy goldenrods out there, um, but strong enough where it can be brought into a meadow setting. Um, here I've got it growing in one of my blue um, stem meadows out at Norcross, um, and it works well against other plants like Joe Pye weeds and iron weeds and bee bombs, where you need something that can kind of hold its own a little bit, um, but not you know go so crazy as to take over the whole area. So viburnum was one of the few shrubs that got its own special section because there's just enough species where they kind of all need to be talked about. Um, but in general, each species is going to flower in the spring. This one here is viburnum opulus. It's the cranberry bush viburnum. Um, you get fruits in the summer. That is viburnum nudum. Um, and they're all going to give you, to one extent or another, really nice fall foliage. Some of them, like viburnum acerfolium here, I think is really one of the best for fall foliage. Other ones, you know, a little bit different. Um, but they've all got these flowers, these berries, and then the kind of fall color. So the difference comes down to, in many cases, environmental needs. The nice thing about viburnums is I wouldn't fall in love with any one species. There's a viburnum that'll grow well in just about any conditions you've got, um, whether it be shade or dry or moist or sun. Um, so for a lot of gardens, I tend to recommend viburnum nudum. Um, white rod. This is one that you'll find comes in two different subspecies. Um, one is native a little bit south of us, um, native in, I think it gets as far north as about Connecticut. It gets into New England um, and it overlaps with the northern variety, um, which is variety Cassinoides. Um, that one goes from Connecticut up through Canada. They're both native to our area. They're both fantastic plants. Um, you get the flowers in the spring. The berries will go into this kind of light pink color and then will darken up to this deeper blue. And it's really nice when you get them kind of in between the pink and blue here. Um, these, the viburnums in general are all kind of, they're, they're, they hit all the buttons. Um, the flowers in the spring are a really good source for our passing butterflies and moths. Um, the, the berries in the summertime are very important for the birds, specifically the blueberries are very high in fats um, and proteins, which is something that's tough to find in the berry world and something birds really make good use of. And they're all important host plants for the different um, caterpillars on the landscape. Viburnum lentago is kind of like the bigger brother to Viburnum nudum. Um, it, it works very well in the same exact conditions. Um, the real difference is Viburnum nudum usually gets somewhere in the kind of five to eight foot tall range. Um, Viburnum lentagum can get quite a bit taller, growing into almost a small scale tree, 12 to maybe 18 feet tall. Um, this is a beautiful plant if you've got the space for a nice robust kind of you know, demonstration shrub. Um, it's also one that works well on hedge lines and wind breaks and, you know, kind of areas like that where you need something utilitarian that also provides all of these pollinator benefits. Um, berries on both of these are edible, not half bad tasting. Um, they're not good enough where I think they're ever going to find their way into the, the farm as, as like, you know, an actual food crop. Um, that being said, if you've got them, I definitely recommend eating them. They're not half bad. If you've got sunny moist sites, I'm thinking pond sides, river sides, stream sides, um, Viburnum opulus variety americanum, that's the American cranberry bush. Um, there's a European Viburnum opulus, um, variety opulus. Um, so if it's just listed as Viburnum opulus in the nursery, try and find out if you've got the American or the not, if you want all that kind of habitat value in addition to um, the show. Um, also though, the berries on opulus americanum are really quite tasty. Um, this is, this is a really nice cranberry. It tastes almost identical to a typical bog cranberry, but with a very distinctly different texture. Um, you know, a little more juicy with a large seed inside versus the kind of spongy texture you get on the bog cranberries with very, very small seeds inside. Um, the American one tastes great. The European one does not. It is not what I would consider an edible species, at least not a palatable species. Um, so if you're ever thinking about, you know, eating these, you definitely want to make sure you've got the American. Viburnum prunifolium blackhaw, this is actually a rare species in the wild, but a, a pretty easy one to find in cultivation and very adaptable on the landscape. Um, grows just about anywhere that you'd think of as kind of typical garden space, as long as it's not too shady, but it's also tolerant of the very sunny, dry sites where a few other things thrive. Um, this is also one that'll turn into like a small scale tree, um, you know, 15 to 18 feet tall, almost having an appearance similar to a crab apple with a bit of a almost weep on the edges. Viburnum acerfolium, um, my prime choice when it comes to dry shady sites, um, which I've got a lot of, so this is one I grow a lot of. Uh, maple leaf viburnum, um, leaves look quite a bit like a maple. Fall color on this one I think is probably better than just about any other with maybe the exception of viburnum lantanoides, um, the hobble bush, which you really can't grow unless you're in New Hampshire or Vermont or Maine. It's really a species of the north. Um, viburnum acerfolium though, this one you can grow all throughout New England. Um, shady dry sites are perfectly fine. It'll also do just fine in sun, 
Um, it doesn't want full sun dry sites, but full sun with good soil is perfectly fine and, and partial shade and dry sites just fine as well. These are all host plants for the green marvel, um, which I think sounds kind of like a DC superhero, um, but it's also this very cool moth. The dogwoods don't get enough attention these days. Um, we hear a lot about single species and we kind of miss some of the others. Um, Cornus or Swida rasmosa, the gray dogwood. Um, this one doesn't have nearly the twig show that the red twig dogwood has. We'll get to that one in a second, but the flower show on it is quite a bit showier. Um, big showy flowers um, that attract some larger um, bumblebees and some of the larger predatory wasps. Um, whereas when you get into the other species, you find the smaller mining bees and some of the smaller surfeit flies coming in. Um, a really cool berry display, white berries against this red kind of peduncle. There's your word of the day, peduncle. It's just the stem that holds the berry in place. Um, but these are this kind of cool contrast that you get later in the season. Um, perfectly fine in moist soils, also perfectly fine in average garden soils. Um, they like sun. A little bit of shade is not a big deal, but this isn't a shade plant. So out of Sericea, this is red twig dogwood. Um, this one is probably one of the nicest looking shrubs when it comes to late winter interest. Um, you can imagine those bright red stems, you know, when there's just snow all over the ground can really be quite breathtaking and really show off nicely. Um, the stems on the dogwoods are also um, used not as often as some others, but they are used as overwintering habitat for some of our native bees. A lot of them have a soft pith um, and that makes it easy for a bee to burrow in and kind of find a little home for the winter time. Um, other ones that do that, that actually do it even better, are the elderberries and the raspberries. Um, so that's Sambucus and Rubus, um, and a whole bunch of herbaceous plants as well. This is a red twig dogwood in fall. Um, if it's getting shade, it doesn't really give you much fall foliage. But if you get these dogwoods into the sun, they can really show off in the late season. This is the fragile dogwood bee. This is an extremely specialized bee that feeds only on dogwoods. It's a New England native. You also find it in the Appalachian region. And if there are not dogwoods on the landscape, you will not have this bee. Um, this is where these kind of specialized native species really come into question. Drain Immaculatum. Um, this is one of those kind of, um, I don't know if I'd call this quite a solution plant, but it's one that I use somewhat regularly. Works well on trail edges. It's good at kind of filling in. I've, I've seen this on pond edges, on roadsides, when you've got kind of a woodland road or a road kind of moving, you know, a pretty much a less traveled road, like a logging road. Um, it's fine in moist areas. It's fine in reasonably dry sites. It'll do full sun. It'll do partial shade. It's got a lot to offer. Um, it's also an important host plant for Lepidoptera and feeds bees in the form of those flowers as well. It's a pretty good nectar source. Um, foliage, as you can see, is this kind of wildly divided leaf. Um, I find it texturally interesting even when the flowers are not there. There's a white form um, that is actually pretty common on the landscape. And if you are lucky enough to see some, you can collect some seed off of the white form and sow it out. And you won't get pure white with your seed crop, um, but you'll see more white ones coming out of that. Um, what we've got here is one of the, uh, that is not a serpent fly, that's another green metallic sweat bee um, and one of our ants just hanging out for the heck of it. Later in the season, you get these uh, candelabra-like fruits. Um, I think I can get a, um, can you see, can you see what I'm doing here, Doug? Yeah? All right, good. Um, so what you're looking at here is the actual fruit. And notice down here on the bottom, um, you can see there's one of these fruits that hasn't actually kind of risen up to the others. What this plant will do is it produces, it starts with all of them down below like this. Um, and there's a seed hidden within that little kind of spot there. Um, and as it dries, there's pretty much like a natural glue in there that starts to break down. And then the things will fling themselves up like these and shoot these seeds off on you. Um, it's something I've always wanted to catch happening. I see evidence of it. I see this and you see seedlings usually about five, you know, three to five feet from the mother plant. I've never actually caught it do it. Um, one day I'm going to catch it though. Now, can I make that go away? Oh, that's just going to stay there. Let's see if it goes with the next slide. It does. Let's find out how to make that go away. <laughs> um, clear. Yeah. Clear all drawings. There we go. Okay. So into Physocarpus. Um, this is nine bark. Um, this is a shrub that uh, used to be really popular and then kind of went out of style and came back recently in the guise of a number of cultivars. Um, this is a pretty cool native species. Um, come on, slides, got to get moving now. There we go. Um, so flowers in spring, you see these uh, kind of fruits that form in the later season. They got a little bit of a show to them. Um, as they open up, they will eventually become bird seed, although the birds don't really flock to them, but they will eventually eat the things. 
Um, this is where they've become quite popular. You've got two very common cultivars on the market. On the left is Diablo, on the right is Capertunia. Um, this is, um, I can go on about the value of native cultivars or in some cases the lack of value on native cultivars for hours. Um, I don't think we have hours to talk about it, but I wanna kind of give you the quick version of it today. Um, so when it comes down to it, native plants as a natural species, as in an uncultivated form, as in whoop, this guy, green leaves, white flowers, red fruits, um, the natural one, um, are going to, in most cases, be the more valuable, um, or they're always going to be the more valuable choice when it comes to kind of ecosystem function, wildlife value, pollinator habitat. Um, there has been quite a bit of study recently on the value of cultivars as they compare to the value of that natural species. And the simple answer is that there's no simple answer. Um, they, in many cases, come down to a specific cultivar and a specific species being very different to another specific cultivar. Um, so, for example, there was a study done on Monarda cultivars, um, bee bombs. So they, they studied raspberry wine, Jacob Klein, some of the other common cultivars, um, and the natural species. And they found for adult visitation, as in active, you know, bees or butterflies, not caterpillars, that'd be, you know, young visitation, um, the, the natural species um, was visited something like 50 times in a time period, and the cultivars were visited somewhere in the range of 35 times. Um, so still definitely a valuable plant, not quite as valuable as the natural species, but definitely something that has value on the landscape. Compare that to something like Astronova anglae. Um, they tested Almapachki and Purple Dome and a couple others that I had not heard of. Um, and the natural species got something like 400 visits in its um, time period. And Purple Dome got six visits in its time period. Um, there's a huge difference there, this 400 versus six. And you can almost say that Purple Dome really doesn't have a lot of value on the landscape, whereas the natural species does. Um, quite different from the bee bomb trials. Um, and neither of these trials were looking at young visitation, as in caterpillars feeding on the leaves. Um, that's something that Doug Talame has recently started doing, and he's pretty much showing us that red leaves are really not good for caterpillars. Um, but that's a different problem altogether. So here's where things tend to come down. Um, if you want to get dogmatic about it, you say that, natu you know, that cultivars are, are not even native species and they don't have value on the landscape and you shouldn't plant it. I've never really liked the dogmatic approach. I don't find it very healthy. Um, what I'm going to go with is when possible, plant the natural species. It's going to have more value on the landscape than the cultivar will. Um, if you really like a native cultivar, plant the native cultivar. If you really like that purple leaf, plant the purple leaf Diablo that you see on the left there. Then also on your landscape, try and include the natural species of that, that cultivar you planted. So natural species, Physocarpus opulifolius, as well as the Diablo opulifolius. This means that you've got that purple leaf that you really like, but you're also making sure to bring in the plant that you know has that really important ecosystem value. Um, and you can kind of get the best of both worlds and you can enjoy your cultivar and you can also say, well, I've also done good on the landscape. Um, one situation where I would say cultivars make a whole heck of a lot of sense is in edible species. Um, normally when we think about edible species, we're talking about tomatoes and peppers and you know, annual kind of food crops. Um, but when I talk about edible species, I'm mostly referring to native edibles. So that might be blueberries, that might be raspberries, that might be ramps, fiddleheads. Um, and there's been a lot of work towards cultivating native plants for their edible value. Um, and the cultivation is usually in the form of good food production, as in, you know, lots of berries, or maybe disease resistance or an adaptability or something to that extent. And there is always a good argument for more of us growing more of our own food. Um, you know, the, the kind of the organic farms that I think most of NOFA is associated with are, are in, for the most part, usually beneficial on the landscape, definitely beneficial for humans. It's a very different beast from the kind of large scale agriculture that we think of when we think of kind of big ag. Um, and big ag is a major push towards habitat loss on the landscape. So the more that we could get people growing their own food and the more we can get people kind of relying um, on themselves on the kind of small scale, multi-diverse organic farms and less on the large scale agriculture, um, the less habitat loss we get. Um, and this is why I'm always gonna push people to grow more food. Um, and that means grow more tomatoes and that means support your farmer, the good farmers. It also means bring in the native edibles um, because in that case, you're not only feeding yourself but you're providing this ecosystem value as well. So grow your blueberries, grow your raspberries, grow your service berries. And later on when we get to the edible section of this class, I will show you some more plants that I'm hoping you haven't heard of yet because it's always fun to find new flavors. 
Um, so there's my not quite 30 second rant on um, cultivars. That can be expanded into a multi-hour rant if you wanna hear it. Um, so here, this picture here, what I wanted to show you is the reason we call it nine bark. A lot of people don't know that nine bark has beautiful bark, supposedly nine layers. I don't think that's true, but it's a good story anyway. Um, and a lot of these cultivars that are cultivated for their foliage are also very bushy and you never see the trunk. Um, so getting that natural species in not only gives you the ecosystem function, but shows you a different part of the plant that you might not have seen if you're only working with Diablo, Copertunia, and the various other cultivars on the market. Another one of the plants that the Cecropia moth will um, feed on. This is one that I really like because I'm not very good at identifying my caterpillars and you really can't screw this one up. Nothing else looks like it. And I've got good pictures. So I tend to include it in those plants that it eats. Okay, um, let me try and give you plants that you don't expect are really valuable to pollinators. This is where I'd like to kind of try and hopefully get the idea across that, that it's not necessarily just about the flowers, that there's these different connections we might not recognize. Um, little blue stem is a great example. This is a native grass. You will never ever see an insect visiting the flower on this plant. Um, but what you do see is, or if you're looking for it, you'll see it is a variety of different specialized um, native silk moths that'll feed on the leaves of this. Um, the promethea moth, the eel moth, um, I think I'm remembering the moths correctly, that will feed on this one and will not feed on just about, well, they have about five or six different grasses they feed on. This is one of them. Panicum brigatum, another um, important grass for this caterpillar value. Um, these are ones that are, are not visited for, you know, you don't see the pollinators on these grasses. Um, you'll see the caterpillars if you go looking for them, but most of the time we don't even notice the value that they're providing. Um, here it is, this is it in back of, um, you can see some Pycnanthum muticum there, and I think the plant on the left is probably Amsonia. Um, though there's a Vernonia that looks a bit like that, but I'm guessing Amsonia. Um, this is a garden that was planted in um, at the, the um, it's the native plant garden in front of the public library on Martha's Vineyard. Um, so this is an area where Martha's Vineyard is pretty much just a giant pile of sand. Um, so very, very well-drained soils and Panicum brigatum is doing quite well there, um, as well as the Amsonia and the Pycnanthemum. I think we'll talk about those later. Looks great in fall. Um, really rich kind of fall colors that just kind of make you think of the season. This is, this is one of the, uh, the, you won't find the pink streak um, moth on the um, grass, but you'll find its caterpillar on the grass. It's a cool species. I've never seen this one live. Gladitia tricanthus. Um, so this is, um, what I'm getting at here is that um, I think we need to get off this, um, you know, sometimes we think too strongly about what is native and it's really got to be native to my local area and you know native to the county or to the state or to some random political line and the new research is showing us that that sort of strict definition of native is not doing us any favors on the landscape um broadening our perspectives a bit to look at things on a more regional context tends to have much greater effects so this is a species, Gladitia, that is not actually a New England native at all. And yet if you plant this tree in New England, you're gonna support about 330 native New England pollinators. Um, this, is, this is taking this kind of idea of native away from um, political lines or times and regions and putting it more into an ecological context. Um, so this is something that um, Doug Talamay did in one of his books with Rick Dark, um, The Living Landscape. Um, they define native instead of, you know, typical definition is something saying, you know, native to Massachusetts before European settlement. Um, what they did was to say native is something that has developed complex and beneficial relationships with the greater ecosystem. So it's nothing to do with range and it's nothing to do with time. It's got to do with feeding life on the landscape. Um, and I think this is really the direction that eco ecological science is going. Um, we have a very fragmented landscape um, and planting plants on a fragmented kind of, you know, idea of these political lines really doesn't make sense when we should be looking at trying to diversify our landscape as much as we can within reason. Um, Gladitia is native to Pennsylvania. It gets, you know, native and south of us. I'm not saying we should be planting Florida plants and California plants in New England, um, but expanding outside of state lines and looking at region is a really good idea. Um, this is a plant, this is this, I believe this picture here is a cultivar. There's one that is commonly sold. I think it's called Sunburst or Sunstream where it turns all yellow on the new growth. 
Um, what you've got here is a tree that usually doesn't get much more than about 30 feet tall, is extremely pollution tolerant and compaction tolerant. Um, so a really good kind of street tree for urban environments um, can have some really nice show. So people tend to like it, has a, um, a flower that isn't very visible, but smells wonderful um, and is a really important host site for a variety of different insects. If you source the natural species, which most people don't, um, it's covered in these giant mean thorns. Um, what you can also find is a naturally occurring form called Gladitia tricanthus. I don't have the name up here. Um, Gladitia tricanthus variety enormous. And enormous is a thornless honey locust, which occurs completely naturally um, and also is able to grow via seed. So what you've got is pretty much a, an uncultivated, unique form um, where if you're looking to plant this plant in a place where you don't want giant thorns, there's a very good option for you. Um, really nice yellow fall color. Um, and as I said, this is one of the important plants. Eel moth is one of our native New England moths. This is a specialized moth. It only feeds on a couple different things. And one of them is a tree that doesn't actually naturally grow here in New England. Um, and that's why I think we need to start looking at this broader context when we talk about native. Virginia creeper, most people like to just think of this as a weed. Um, it is a weed. It's a really great, it's a, it's a useful weed, especially in certain areas. Um, actually looks really cool in cemeteries. Um, this was... I think this was also on Martha's Vineyard, if I remember correctly, um, but there was a cemetery with all these kind of old stones and Virginia creeper just growing over uh, the top of it. And you could tell that this, this was a well-cultivated landscape. You know, someone was in there weeding and taking care of things, and they purposely allowed this to grow on the stones because it just added a really kind of unique look and a kind of texture. Um, it's also a really valuable plant for the ecosystem. Um, despite being quite a strong growing species. These blueberries that you get late in the season are also very high in those kind of fats and proteins that birds need right before the winter time. It's also the host plant for some really cool native um, moths. These are the, the sphinx moths, and this one here is the Pandora sphinx moth. They got that creepy eye spot on the back of their head. Um, it's supposed to make them look like a snake so the birds won't eat them. I don't know if it works. Um, they creep me out. It's a pretty cool looking moth. Carpinus caroliniana, another good choice if you're looking for kind of a small scale tree. Um, this can be grown, if it's growing in the shade, it tends to naturally form a kind of multi-stemmed, almost large shrub-like appearance. Um, these are ones that are also often brought into more kind of urban or formal settings and are pruned to give you this kind of single stem look, which it, it will do quite happily. And then you get a much more kind of formal look. Um, so whether this is something you want to bring into a garden or on a roadside or put into kind of, you know, an urban environment, this is a great pollinator tree. Um, another one that kind of gives us this valuable, um, you know, kind of leaf form pretty much that is fed on by insects. Keep an eye out if you're looking to source this one. This is the native Carpinus caroliniana. There's also a European musselwood, which is very common in the nursery trade um, and is usually the one you find planted in the urban settings. Um, that being said, you can do it with the native one just fine. Great fall color if you've got this one in the sun. Um, it's actually quite shade tolerant. So if you're looking for a good shade tolerant small scale tree, you can plant this one, but you lose your fall color. Um, though still a useful plant. Comptonia peregrina, the sweet fern. This is not a fern. It does not flower in the typical sense. It's actually a shrub. Um, it's got this wonderful scent to it. It's one that I really like to plant um, along kind of trail sides um, or here this kind of, you know, retaining wall where you could sit on the wall and kind of rub up against this. It's got this wonderful kind of cinnamon like flavor that, that just permeates the air. Um, this again is a picture from Martha's Vineyard. Um, this is growing in just a very, very, very sandy bank. They put in this retaining wall and then just covered it in sweet fern. Um, is a fantastic species. It can be a little bit challenging to get this one established. It takes a couple, you know, a couple seasons for it to kind of settle in and it's just kind of not growing and you're wondering why it's not doing anything. And then it finally gets established and will fill in thickly and will grow in some of the most difficult conditions ever, including full sun, sandy soils. Um, but you got to be patient with it at first. Um, despite the fact that it'll grow in the driest sites ever, give it plenty of water for that first establishment year. Um, after that, it should be just fine. This is one that doesn't actually feed a great diversity of insects, but you get some really important specialists kind of kicking in on this and some other closely related plants um, like sweet gale um, and like Morella, Morella caroliniensis, which is a bayberry. The sumacs are wonderful choices for a variety of different purposes. Great for windbreaks, um, great for parking lot islands, great for tree pits, also great for gardens if you're talking about this species here, Rus aromatica. 
Um, this one is reasonably well behaved, whereas the other ones I think are really quite a bit pushier, um, which is really helpful for things like windbreaks and tree pits and you know challenging conditions. Um, but if you want a well behaved plant, Russa aromatica is the one for you. Um, this is it here at, um, at the Cambridge Water Supply at Fresh Pond. Um, parking lot on the right, road on the left, the trees keep dying and the Russa aromatica is doing just fine. Um, this is almost definitely a cultivated form called Grolo that is quite dwarfed, um, usually grows three to four feet tall. Natural species does more like five to six feet tall and sometimes a bit more if it's in the really right conditions. Um, but this is a good plant for a variety of uses. Um, and kind of going back to my, my cultivar rant a little bit, I will always take a native cultivar over a non-native species. Um, so if your choice is, you know, Rus aromatica grolo in this parking lot island or, you know, an Asian azalea, I'm going to take that grolo any day of the week. Um, the showy emerald, one of, one of many that feed on Rus. Um, the sumacs in general are just a really great, um, you know, genus in, in general. Rosa virginiana. Um, in general, when I hear rose, I tend to think high maintenance. Um, you know, and that's referring to your kind of typical English roses, the hybrid tea roses, the, the non-native roses. Um, our native roses are kind of the other end of the spectrum. Um, in some cases, they're almost weedy. Um, Rosa virginiana, Rosa caroliniana are colonizing um, roses. Um, they're quite adapted to sunny, dry sites, though they're perfectly happy if they get moisture. A little bit of shade's not going to slow them down, and they're going to form a colony, and they're going to kind of run along on you. Um, really good if you got a steep slope that you're looking to kind of plant something that can just run the whole slope, colonize, and not need to get mowed. Um, that being said, these are also ones you can work into meadow-like conditions and hit with a brush mower every one to three years, and they're perfectly fine with that treatment. Um, another one that is really valuable, both as its leaf for Lepidoptera, but also as its flower as a good source of pollen. Hips later in the season fed on by birds. Um, they are technically edible to humans. Some of them are better than others. Some of them need really good um, preparation in order to eat. This is not something I tend to eat all that often, though they don't make a half bad tea, um, but the birds most certainly make good use of them. And the fall color on our native roses is arguably better looking than the flowers. Um, our native rose flowers are, are single flowers, you know, five petals instead of the, the 30 or 40 petals you'll find on a hybrid tea rose that would never survive our winter anyway. Um, but those roses don't give you fall color, and Rosa virginiana and Carolina most certainly do, at least if they're getting good sun. Okay. How's my timing? 7.02. We're running until 7.30. I'd like to keep going a little bit. I want to kind of try and end with a good 15 minutes to kind of talk stuff over, but let me see if I can get through another section or two, and, and then we'll go for questions. Um, Doug, does that sound about right to you? All right. Okay, so let's talk about lawns. Um, lawns are stupid is my kind of simple way of putting it. Um, I don't understand our kind of obsession with these things. Um, we've got a plant that is, is a non-native species, requires a whole lot of work, and doesn't offer anything to us. It does not feed us. It requires tons of water, and in order to keep a, the perfect lawn that you see in this picture, um, it usually requires a whole lot of inputs in the forms of pesticides, herbicides, fertilizer, and all sorts of other junk. Um, so I want a replacement. I want something that's going to function as a lawn, but is not going to be pretty much an ecological disaster. Um, so I want a lawn that doesn't need to be watered. Um, I am perfectly fine watering absolutely everything I put in the ground when I first put it in the ground, and I want to help it get established. Um, and if I'm talking about my annual crops, you know, my tomatoes and peppers and things that are not adapted to New England, I'm happy to do a little bit of extra work and get some food out of it. But when it comes to native species, I don't want to water ever again. I want to get them established and I want them well adapted to the site so they can then take care of themselves afterwards. And that goes true for lawns too. So no supplemental watering. Um, I don't fertilize um, any of my kind of permanent native plantings. Um, if you want to throw down some fertilizer in your you know, vegetable garden, that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, but when we're talking about establishing healthy landscapes and native plants, fertilizer is simply not needed. I want to feed pollinators. I don't see any reason why we can say that lawns don't need to be valuable to pollinators. I want to see a lawn as a part of the solution, um, not as a part of the problem. And if it's going to feed pollinators, the last thing I want is them coming into contact with pesticides and herbicides and anything that ends in side, which means kill. And if it's going to be a lawn, it's got to tolerate at least some foot traffic. Um, and this is the kind of important part of, of certain lawns and maybe not so important with others. And this is where each person kind of decides for themselves. 
Um, are we talking about a lawn that is going to be stepped on every day? Um, at home where I live, I've got a lawn that needs to deal with free range chickens, two dogs, one of which who likes to dig, um, and me and my wife and all our friends who come over and trample our lawn and walk in our gardens and look at our meadow and so on. Um, so it's a high foot traffic area. I talk to other people about killing lawns and say, you know, how often do you walk on your lawn? And they say, well, my kids left the house. They don't play on it anymore. I walk on my lawn once a day to go get the mail. Um, much lower foot traffic. And so you can grow something in that area that I might not be able to grow at home where I need, you know, it to stand up to my dogs. So there's why, um, what I think is better. This is why I think lawns are wasting our time. Um, we dump 90 million pounds of herbicides on lawns and gardens annually. Um, that is a lot of herbicide. And that's not pesticides, that's not you know, fungicides, that's specifically herbicides. That's in many cases, Roundup, glyphosate, but other herbicides as well. Two million pounds of fertilizer runs off into the Gulf of Mexico annually. This is a problem that's not just lawns, um, but also gardens and the kind of you know, over fertilization in kind of large scale agriculture. Um, and what this does is this gets into the Gulf of Mexico and forms the Gulf dead zone. Um, and dead zones are really not a good thing. Um, what happens is that this extra nutrients that gets into the water causes major algae blooms. Um, the algae coats the surface and interrupts light's ability to penetrate the water. Um, and what that does is to shut down oxygen cycling in the water and everything dies. Um, really not a good thing. We waste 9 billion gallons of water every single day on lawns alone in America alone. Um, that is a huge amount of water dumped on a crop that is that takes up more space than corn and soy combined and doesn't actually feed us at all, nor does it feed the wildlife. Um, to put that into perspective, if we could somehow get that water anywhere in the world that we wanted to, we could give every single person on this planet who's currently lacking clean drinking water seven gallons every single day. Um, that is a huge amount of water wasted on pretty much a useless crop that could be put to better use. And when I talk to people about removing lawns um, and they tell me that their kids and their dogs like to play on it, I worry about the pesticide exposure. Um, there are a lot of pesticides that are used on the traditional kind of lawn. Um, and by traditional, I mean the lawn where you're, you know, the, the neighbor that was really, really, you know, focused on his lawn and has true, um, what are they called now? They used to be chem lawn, now they're true green. They come over and they give him the full thing and, you know, they're fertilizing every couple of weeks and they're mowing it regularly and this and that. Um, and you get all this junk as well to try and keep the pests away because you've got a plant that just simply isn't adapted to our environment. So it needs pretty much help from us. Um, lawns are kind of gardens on intensive care. So what if you could have this? Um, what if you can have a lawn that looks like this? This is the same plant twice, once unmowed, once mowed. This is a native species. This is Carex pensylvanica. Um, this is the one I mentioned at the beginning of the lecture when I told you that this one plant supports 36 different pollinators. Um, so remember, again, the caterpillars are the ones that'll feed on this. Um, so you may not see bees and butterflies on it, but this is still an important active part of the ecosystem. This is a native sedge. Um, it's a rhizomatous species that naturally grows under pine trees. And what that means is you've got a plant that is perfectly fine growing in thin soils where typical lawns tend to fail. It's also adapted to shady conditions, but it'll do fine in the sun as well. And being a rhizomatous species, if you dig a hole in the middle of it, it'll fill right back in. You don't need to throw down any new seed or anything like that. It, it spreads. Um, it's also a plant that puts on all of its growth in the spring. Um, so what you see on this picture on the right, we would mow it once, um, usually pretty much in early summer, and then it would stay short for the rest of the season, and we wouldn't have to mow it any more times. Um, so a single mowing a year, maybe two to three if you really feel like mowing it. Um, sometimes you can get away with mowing this every other year just to kind of keep tree seedlings out. Um, and you've got a very effective lawn. This will handle moderate foot traffic. This is not one for me to do at home with free range chickens and dogs. Um, but if you're walking you know, over to your lawn every day to get the mail, or if you want something that looks like a lawn but doesn't necessarily need to function like a soccer field, this is a really good option for you. This is left entirely unmowed. Um, each blade gets probably in the kind of seven to nine inch range, but they'll nod over and the lawn usually doesn't stand much more than four to five inches tall. Um, so if you like that kind of lush, rich look, you really don't need to mow it at all. And if you want to keep it looking more formal, you could mow it pretty much now and it will stay, well, now is in, in the picture now, not now here. We're, we're a little early today. Um, mow it in a month's time and it'll stay short for the rest of the season. This is what I'm doing at home. 
Um, this is for Gary Virginiana. This is wild strawberry. The picture on the left is the lawn that we built when I was still at Garden in the Woods. Um, this is something I'm doing at my home in Phillipston. It's also something that I'm doing as a part of the native edible garden at Norcross Wildlife Sanctuary. Um, the plants are just starting to bloom now, um, pretty much all throughout New England. They've got these white flowers on them that are food for some generalist bees. Um, the flowers on this plant aren't anything all that exceptional when it comes to um, you know, pollinator value. It's the leaves on this one that are most valuable. Um, notice in this picture, ignore the fruit for a second, but look at the leaves um, below the fruit. Let me get my, uh, my, my, my showy out, there we go. See how ratty these leaves are? How much damage has been done on these? Um, this is because these are, this, this plant is more valuable than any other herbaceous plant in the New England flora with the exception of goldenrods. Um, goldenrod is top of the list and wild strawberry is number two on the list. Supports about 86 different species of um, caterpillars here in Massachusetts. Um, and you'll find that, um, yep, there we go, it can go away. Um, and you'll find that number is all gonna be within range um, for various different parts of the area. Um, I saw in Vermont, I think the number was 83. In Pennsylvania, I think it was 92. Um, you get the idea, very high numbers. Um, compare that to say bee balm, which is a great pollinator plant, by the way, that supports eight species. This supports 87. Um, and the berries are a wonderful added bonus for you, for me, for my dog, for the chipmunks, for the birds, for anyone else who wants to eat them. Okay, I want to give you a tool before we open it up to questions, um, because a lot of times people are asking me, you know, what can I plant in my specific area? This is a database that I built um, back when I was at Garden in the Woods, and um, one of my then co-workers, um, Melanie Kenny and, and Uli Lorimer have been working on it and expanding it, which is really wonderful. Because the other day I went to check in on it and found they just recently added a whole bunch of new information, which is great. Um, you can find a link to this on my website, which I'll have a link to up in just a second. Um, so what this is, is it allows you to pick specific things you're trying to kind of accomplish on your landscape. So um, I ran this this morning. Um, I pretty much garden in sunny, dry sites, and I'm always into eating things. So I punch sun, dry, and edible into my, you know, kind of search. I hit, hit begin search at the bottom, and I got 47 different plants that popped up. Um, all of these are edible in one way or another, some of them a little more clearly than others. I mean, you find something like service berries, it's got a big berry on it. See something like sugar maple, you're thinking about maple syrup. And then you see things like hazelnuts or even junipers, where you're talking about pretty much a spice, juniper berries. Um, think about gin if you're into making cocktails. Um, this is a great database for finding things that work for you. And you'll find other things. Let's get that picture up again. Um, draw. So other things that you can find that I find very um, helpful in here, um, things like low maintenance. Um, somewhere in here I've got, yep, deer and rabbit resistance is definitely a big one. If you're working in cityscapes, urban environment is quite helpful. You get the idea. Um, this is a very usable database that I'd like to think anyone can really put to good use. Um, come on, there we go. And with that in mind, here's the link to my website, dantijaffe.com, and it's got a link on there to that database if you want access to it. We have, um, looking at 18 minutes left, which I think is probably a good amount of time for us to start talking to each other. Um, next week, we're going to start with this, which is You Can Eat Too, which is getting into kind of native edible pollinator perennial low maintenance plants, um, but that's next week. Um, so for now, um, Doug, do you want to take over and organize questions for us? What do we got? Yeah, we have, we have time for questions. And what I think we can do is if you have a question, you can raise your hand, flag me down, or you can type it into the chat box. You can just say, I have a question, and I'll pass the mic over to you. And you can go ahead and ask your question. We can start having a dialogue that way. Would anyone like to, to start first? Susan, would you like to answer or ask that question? I'll unmute you now. You have the mic, Susan. I'm wondering where, where do you go to find these plants? I mean, do yes, um, so it depends a little bit on where you are. Um, there are there's some, there's some pretty darn good sources these days for these. Um, and also depending on how you want to grow things. So for example, if you want to grow stuff from seed, I love Wild Seed Project. Um, it's a company up in Maine. They sell native seeds that they've collected on the landscape. So they're wild collected, natural species. Um, a really good way to get into propagation if you want to start growing your own plants. <laughs> if you're looking for finished plants, um, companies like Garden in the Woods, um, Native Plant Trust, they were New England Wildflower Society and they're, they're you know, um, sister kind of group or, or they're 
propagation facility in the Sami farm, um, a fantastic source for a lot of native plants. Um, if you are a member of a garden club or you work for a landscape company, I recommend getting a commercial account with some of the commercial um, nursery suppliers out there and you can get, um, you know, kind of wholesale prices um, on, on larger orders. Um, the reason I like mentioning garden clubs is because oftentimes a, a five or a $1,200 order is a steep minimum for a single person. But if you get the group together as the garden club, you could usually get to that minimum quite easily. And then you could look at companies like North Creek Nurseries, which are plug sellers. Um, they're mostly in Pennsylvania. They can ship plugs up into this area, produce some great stuff. Um, I like Prairie Moon Nursery and Prairie Nursery. Um, Ernst and Schumacher are both um, seed sources of native naturally occurring seeds. What they do is uh, what's called seed farming. They'll go out in the wild, they will collect seed, they will then grow that seed out in farms um, so that they could then collect seed off of the one they've grown out and take an original collection of 300 seeds and make it into 30,000 seeds and then make them available to the public. So you've got kind of a second generation wild plant, which um, which is fantastic because it's a great way to get large amounts of seed. Um, when I need to buy like 50 pounds of partridge pea, I'm going to them and not the wild seed project where it's literally the, the wild you know, seed that's been found and they're not going to have 50 pounds of anything available. Um, other good sources. So it kind of depends a little bit on where you are. Um, I'm a New Englander and I, I live in Massachusetts, so I know my area better than others. Um, if you're down south um, or let's see, there's... Um, Grow Native Massachusetts, they're a fantastic organization that do a, an annual plant sale that is a huge plant sale and has a, a great selection of plants. The Rhode Island Wild Plant Society also does an annual plant sale. I was just talking to them the other day and I found out they're doing their plant sale this year. They're doing it digitally. Um, you can put in orders, I think, through a website and then they arrange pickups. So they've figured out ways to kind of get around the, you know, the coronavirus epidemic and make these plants available, I believe. Grow Native is doing the same thing. And I know Garden in the Woods is selling plants, um, I think, again, by order. Um, there's also a group called Eisel Plants, um, which is a website that is actually a conglomeration of various other organizations, and they can help you to find some of those harder to find plants. Um, when possible, grow your own. It's a fantastic way to grow a lot of cheap plants. And some of these plants are really, really easy to grow. Um, we'll get into some of the really, really easy ones to grow next uh, week when we get into some of the edibles and others. But but some of these plants are, are really ones that anybody can get their hands on and anyone can grow more of. Great. And Catherine has a question. And now, Catherine, you have the mic. Well, I, I'm just going to read what I, what I wrote here. Um, I, I have a farm and I'd like to include more pollinator plants for the, the health of the tomatoes, peppers, eggplant, cucumber, and squash plants yeah so um what you're going to want to you know you're going to want to get a little bit of everything because you know it's, it's easy to kind of attract them all but what i'm always thinking about when we come we talk about you know companion plants on farm settings is i want to support as much of the predatory insects as i can that'll you know attack the would-be pests in my food crops um the the new research is showing that there's really no need to be planting your plants right next to each other um a companion plant within 50 feet 100 feet is still very effective um so oftentimes doing these kind of wildflower strips on the edges of farm fields or kind of around your your more intensely cultivated area is perfectly effective and makes management a whole lot easier um because then you can just kind of hit them with the mower later in the season or in the following spring when you want to um or kind of move things around more easily um, the native mint family plants are fantastic choices for supporting a lot of our predatory insects. Um, so that includes the mountain mints, the bee bombs. Um, you can throw the black eyed Susans on there. It's not mint family, but that one's just a really good one as well. Um, wild senna is a great choice. Um, senna habera carpa. Um, in terms of really quick establishment, um, our native partridge pea, it's a native annual. It's a fantastic um, kind of, that's one you could actually mix right into your kind of cultivated settings. I actually use it as a bit of a cover crop around my tomatoes and peppers and other things that get pretty big and can kind of just grow up through the Camacrista. Otherwise, it's perfectly fine in those wildflower strips as well. Um, the golden rods are great. You're not going to want to plant things like Solidago rugosa that'll just seed into your farm and become a maintenance problem. But something like Solidago puberella, um, Solidago bicolor, um, Solidago speciosa. Yeah. Speciosa is a bit pushy. You might want to skip that one. Um, but the previous ones are all very well behaved and are not ones that are going to kind of move in in your farm area. Um, 
milkweeds too. The common milkweed is definitely a pushy plant that can become a, a bit problematic in agricultural settings, but um, butterfly milkweed and rose milkweed are great choices. Um, ironweeds, joe pie weeds. Um, we'll get into even more as I go through this. Um, there are a few woody species that I like to mix into my wildflower strips because I can just hit them with the mower as if they were a herbaceous plant. As long as you're not, you know, if you've got a tractor that's got, you know, a big mower on back, you could mow them every three years. If you're talking about a, a somewhat more robust push mower, you're going to want to hit them once a year. Um, the dogwoods are good for that. The spireas are good for that. And our native willows, um, not black willow, because that's going to turn into a tree. Um, but all the shrubby species are great bee fodder. Great. Thanks, Dan. And I'm going to pass the mic over to Britt. Britt, you have it. Oh, thanks. Um, hi, I was, uh, my question was, um, how does barren strawberry compare with wild strawberry? Is it anywhere near as helpful um, as wild strawberry in, in the wild? So, so yes and no. Um, Nothing, it's not nearly as valuable as wild strawberry, though that's no knock against barren strawberry. It's just that wild strawberry happens to just be really, really high on the value scale. Barren strawberry is still quite a valuable plant. It, it's a, a valuable plant, less so for the Lepidoptera, but more so for some of our specialized bees um, that'll visit its flowers and, and will make use of it. Um, the wild strawberry is just really high up there in terms of value. What barren strawberry offers you that wild strawberry doesn't is it's a, it's a plant that can be incorporated into a variety of different areas. Wild strawberry's ability to stand up to the abuse that, say, a lawn could take is due to its vigor. It's a strong growing spreading plant, and you don't necessarily want that everywhere. Um, I actually use it exclusively or um, heavily under my blueberry bushes, under my raspberry bushes. I put it under my grapes. Um, you know, a woody landscape where you just want something to cover underneath, wild strawberry is great for that. Um, but if you're doing, say, a wild strawberry lawn that's adjacent to a nice, delicate herb bed, that strawberry is going to move in. Um, and you're going to constantly have to kind of control it from moving in or come up with some sort of a barrier for it. Um, you know, its vigor is valuable when you need a plant you can abuse, but it's also challenging when you decide where you can and can't put it. Um, so the barren strawberry is still a fantastic plant, just not quite as valuable as wild strawberry. Okay, thank you. I'm seeing a question about designing a pollinator garden at a look museum. Um, website's a good place to start, and I've this, done this before. Can you see this place you mentioned? Plant seeds include slides. All right. Um, so the, the question is about designing a garden at a, at a museum. Um, what I really like about gardens at, you know, public places, museums included, schools, you know, parks, anything like that, is I want a garden that can be grown in a way where people can interact directly with the plants. I want people going up to the plants, touching them, smelling them, tasting them. Um, so the, the mint family plants that I mentioned earlier as great companion plants are great because they have a good fragrance. You know, the mountain mint smell minty, the bee balm smells bee balm -y. And I will take every kid I see right up to these plants and say, here, rub the leaf, smell it, see what it, what it smells like for you. Um, I will also include spice bush in my kind of, you know, really high public interaction plants. It's a woody species. It's the host plant for the spice bush swallowtail. Let me see if I think I could probably just get a picture of that for you. Um, the reason I really like the spice bush swallowtail is it is, I think, a really good ambassador for people to interact um, with insects in a way they might not have before. Um, come on, there we go. Uh, you can see my screen, right? You're all seeing what I'm doing here. All right, so that is the spice bush swallowtail. Um, that is, as far as I'm concerned, one of the most adorable caterpillars in New England. And it's, it's, what I like about it is once you have the spice bush in place, I will often, this is something I do with kids regularly, I will take the kids and we'll go kind of right underneath the spice bush and look up at the foliage so that the sky is right above it and the leaves become kind of somewhat translucent. Um, and you'll be looking through this and look for a leaf that doesn't look translucent. It's curled into a little bit of a ball and it'll look solid inside. And if you then grab that leaf and delicately open it up, you'll find this guy hanging out inside waiting. Um, or maybe he was there yesterday or the day before. You won't find him in every one, but they're pretty easy to find. Um, and it's a great way to start getting people to interact with insects in a way where it's like, wait, this is a, a valuable pollinator, an important part of the ecosystem, and not just, oh, insects are pests, let's kill them all. Um, so spice bush is on my list. Um, other ones that I like um, are ones that people can kind of come into contact with and really touch and smell. The Comptonia, the sweet fern that I talked about is a good one. Um, yellow and black birch, those are the trees that gave us birch beer and root beer. And if you kind of break the bark and smell it, it's got this sweet kind of wintergreen smell. And it's really nice, again, to get people interacting with these plants. 
Um, and whenever possible, and this might depend on your situation, I like to plant plants that produce berries that I can encourage people to eat. Um, you know, that, that might not work in every area, depending on, you know, liabilities and all the other stuff that we need to kind of think about. But when we can get people directly interacting and actually tasting our plants, it, it leads towards a stewardship of the land, a connection with the land that I think is lacking in, in many people these days. Um, and this is why I've always encouraged people eating plants. I mean, even when I was working at places where we're really encouraging, you know, plants specifically for wildlife value, I want people eating them because it means people get a connection. Um, and then everyone becomes a plant ambassador. All right. Great. I love Next. Yeah. Do we have more questions? Yeah, we have a question from Libby and I'm going to pass. Libby has the mic now. Hi. So, um, so I'm really interested in the idea of a wild strawberry lawn, but it sounds like you'd need to buy lots of plants to achieve that. Is that right? Or, or is it a lawn, a lawn that you can start from seed? And either way, where would we buy in bulk? Okay, so um, I'm sorry, another yes and no, but let me explain. Um, you, you don't necessarily need to buy a lot of plants specifically because it's very fast growing. So you can actually space these plants out a lot more than you would if you were growing a lot less vigorous plants. And you know, with a little bit of time and a little bit of weeding in between, they will then fill in pretty darn quickly, um, which is really quite nice. The, the downside is that this is not a plant that is available in large amounts of seed form. Like you could find a seed packet here and there for two or three dollars, but you can't buy seed in bulk and then just throw it down and grow along that way. Um, so you're looking to buy plants. Um, in the past, that meant buying, you know, like a two quart pot for $12.99, which just feasibility wise doesn't make sense when you're starting to like do whole lawns. Um, when I was at Garden in the Woods, we started growing wild strawberries and then just digging them up um, as bare root divisions and packing them into crates and making them available in bulk that way. We would sell them in groups of 50. So you get 50, 200, 500. Some people would buy a thousand of these things. Um, and the nice thing about that is you're not paying for pot, you're not paying for soil, and you're not paying for the time it would take for that to root into a pot. So the price is a lot lower than if you were to purchase, you know, a finished plant. Um, this is also one that North Creek Nurseries have started selling, so you can get it now as plugs, um, which is a great way to kind of start putting in these lawns. Um, and being a plant that, that spreads vigorously and then divides itself naturally, you don't necessarily need to look at doing your entire lawn in one setting. I would recommend starting kind of piecemeal. Um, I use a product called Ramboard. I'm sure there's other versions of it out there. It's pretty much just rolls of cardboard that painters use to kind of protect floors. And I will roll that right out over my lawn. Um, and then I will top it with usually a combination of well-aged wood chips and compost. And I'll plant strawberries right into that. And do that in maybe 10% of your lawn. Um, get that area established. And then the next season or when you're ready to, you, you smother out another section. And instead of going and buying new strawberries, you can then go into that section you established last year and just take divisions right out of it and move them along to the next session and just start kind of leapfrogging along. Um, it'll take a little longer to do it that way, but it means you do it piecemeal. So it's much less of a big job than trying to do the entire lawn at once. And you could save a lot of money that way. Um, once you get a starter crop of strawberries growing, um, you can really divide and move them pretty much indefinitely. Um, you just need to give them a little bit of time to fill in, but they're vigorous enough where once they fill in, you can take a lot of divisions out of a patch and it just kind of keeps filling right back in. Um, you just throw a little bit of compost down to give them a little boost and they just fill right back in every time. Um, when I was at Garden in the Woods, um, I would often go in and do my divisions before selling plants for the day. And then at the end of the day, I would go up to the Hort guys and say, hey guys, go see if you could tell I did anything in the strawberry patch today. Um, and there was days where I would take 1,200 divisions out of that patch and they would come in and they would say they couldn't tell that I'd done anything. Um, it, it's just, you know, they, they kind of, you just fluff them up right afterwards and it doesn't look like anything happened. If there's any space there, it fills right back in. Um, and I think that's probably the best way to go about it. I would love to one day see seed available that we could just throw down, but I don't think we're going to be there anytime soon. Most people still consider these plants weeds and don't think of them as something that we actually want on the landscape. Um, I'm really glad to see that starting to change. This is the lawn of the future as far as I'm concerned. That's great. Thank you so much. And looking at the time, it's just about 7.30. Well, thank you all so much for coming. Thank yeah, you, thank uh, Doug, you, and the rest of you NOFA folks for making this happen. And uh, see you all on Saturday. Thank yeah, we're all, we're all so grateful. Thank you. Have a good night. Have a good night, everyone. Bye. Thanks.